move on and talk about uh, adding therapy to improve cardiovascular outcomes. And uh, I guess, uh, Zach, I'll, I'll sort of maybe ask you this first. In recent years, the FDA has required long-term cardiovascular outcome trials for diabetes and obesity therapies to ensure safety. And there have been some, some new studies recently. We've talked about the uh, EMPA-REG uh, outcome trial funded by Boehringer Ingelheim. Uh, there's also been the LEADER trial from Novo Nordisk and the IRIS trial from Takeda. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about those trials, uh, what, what you think uh, the evidence result is and what that means for thinking about adding on therapy. So this goes back about eight years. Um, and in 2007, uh, a inflammatory and incorrectly conducted meta-analysis was published in the New England Journal of Medicine suggesting that the thiazolidine dione rosiglitazone was associated with increased cardiovascular outcomes. Um, and that led to a huge outcry and huge pressure on the FDA asking, why didn't you stop this? And then a year or two later was the report of three large cardiovascular outcome trials which attempted to demonstrate that glycemic control actually improved cardiovascular disease. And these were called ACCORD and ADVANCE and the Veterans Administration Diabetes Trial. The ACCORD trial, which sort of threw the kitchen sink at everybody and, and said hypoglycemia is not so important, let's just get the blood sugar down, found about a 20% increase in mortality in intensively treated patients um, as opposed to the standard of care group. Well, between these two um, body blows, the FDA said, we are going to institute some changes and we're going to require that all new drugs have proof, not of cardiovascular benefit, but have, truth, have proof that there couldn't be as much as a 5% chance that there would be a 30% increase in cardiovascular events with this drug. And that started off with total cardiovascular events. It looks like from their latest announcements, the FDA might now be leaning to specific endpoints like heart failure. Well, as a consequence, pharmaceutical industry has carried out these very expensive, hundreds of millions of dollars per trial, cardiovascular safety trials with a variety of drugs to try to show that people who have cardiovascular disease can take these drugs without as much as a 5% chance of increased risk. So we're not trying to show that there's not a statistically significant chance. We're trying to show that there's statistically significant non-chance. It's a very different paradigm. Right. So in this very complicated, messy situation, we've had three recent trials that really are earth shattering. First of all, empagliflozin, an SGLT2 inhibitor, in a relatively small, as these things go, trial, 6,000 people, 2,000 were on usual care, and 4,000 were receiving various doses of empagliflozin, and had a reduction in cardiovascular death. In addition, reduction in hospitalization for heart failure was reported as a secondary endpoint. Then, um, actually just published officially in the New England Journal of Medicine yesterday, uh, but available online uh, about a month or, or two earlier, is a trial that was carried out after uh, pioglitazone became generic now. Um, we've learned a, a long-term trial of pioglitazone in individuals who did not have diabetes, but who had had a stroke and had increased um, uh, levels of insulin resistance. Those individuals have a reduction both in stroke and heart attack when treated with pioglitazone. And it was a complicated trial done the right way. They were careful to avoid heart failure, which is a known complication of this drug. And they showed very appreciable reductions in these two major macrovascular outcomes. And now, just recently, over the past month, by press relief, 
we, that, that, that by actual publication of the trial, um, we've learned from Novo Nordisk that their leader trial with liraglutide shows a reduction in MACE, myocardial infarction, stroke, and cardiovascular mortality. All components were reduced, and the total uh, MACE endpoint was significantly reduced. So now we have a GLP-1 drug, we have a thiazolidine dione, we have an SGLT2 inhibitor, and it's very exciting for the diabetes community because we can say diabetes treatment in people at high risk may actually have unique benefit, and we can talk about potential mechanisms. We don't know why, but it's pretty good. Sure. Michael, any, any thoughts yeah, yeah, on those no, mechanisms? It, yeah, because it, it's, uh, you know, particularly in uh, Empareg, we don't know why the cardiovascular risk decreased because the actual number of events, uh, a heart attack and stroke, didn't really significantly decrease. Between, it was basically the same between the two groups. Um, there's a lot of speculation out there. It certainly wasn't the glycemia. I mean, that's something very important to recognize in all of these trials is, and particularly in Empereg, the, the divergence of the two groups was too early for it to have been the glucose. And it appears to, you know, have accelerated over the time. Um, you know, whether you are a believer that, you know, particularly with Empereg, uh, whether you're a believer that it was the naturesis or the blood pressure or some combination of naturesis, blood pressure, and endo endothelial function, um, it's, it's still, it's, as I agree with Zach, it's a very exciting time. And, and it sort of changes the way we think about choice of medications. You know, we have, we have that list of, you know, does it cause weight gain or not? Does it cause hypoglycemia or not? And now we have an expanded number of drugs that say, well, does it also lower cardiovascular risk uh, uh, beyond its glucose effects? And, you know, obviously that's critically important because the number one reason why people with diabetes die is heart disease. Yeah. And, well, and, 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 and so and anything that's going to lower that, yeah. particularly in people in high risk, uh, it's hard not to consider that a, a really important factor in all of weighing the, the different factors in terms of choice. So with, of with the thiazolidine dions, now I'm thinking back to the studies that showed that people who've, who had PTCA with and without diabetes who were randomized to a thiazolidine dione or not had reduction in restenosis if they were on either rosy or pioglitazone. Uh, maybe that's an outcome. And absolutely, the, the findings of proactive, which was a big trial of pyolidazone, mm -hmm. which showed a 50% reduction in, in, in stroke if you had a history of stroke. That become, and that was actually the rationale for the IRIS trial. Um, that leads us to say, well, people with diabetes who've had strokes, should, if we can be very careful about the known complications of these drugs, should they all have a thiazolidine dione? And then what dose is right? Should we aim for lower doses to avoid compli I mean, there's so much more left to learn. So John, uh, getting back to formulary decisions, your, yeah. uh, your staff is keeping busy, I assume, uh, <laughs> g g given these results. I mean, this is an example where, you know, sort of new evidence really uh, uh, probably has to, to be considered pretty quickly and pretty carefully. Yeah, absolutely. So where there's precedence and where there's evidence that suggests that these medications need to be made available to our members, we definitely want to consider that as we design our drug formularies, realizing that in some instances it's not really a class effect. Um, as right. several so, of the studies you referenced, sure. it was one agent in the class as opposed to right. all so, the agents so in the class. another GLP-1 drug, lixacenatide, which is going to be approved soon and will be much cheaper than liraglutide, did not show cardiovascular benefit. Did not show, benefit. exactly. So, you know, so often when I try to prescribe liraglutide, I get a, a nasty note back, not from you guys, of course, but from some <laughs> other <laughs> unnamed other company. Other unnamed company. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and they say, well, don't use that, use this, uh, which is on our formulary. Now, you're right. We may have to say, well, the, the Actually, unfortunately, and, and I agree with Michael, the most expensive of the GLP-1 drugs, and, and probably shouldn't be, um, is this Novo Nordisk drug, but that one may really have benefit. And I think, again, as we design our formulary, we take information from the various medical societies, the FDA, the CDC, all the available information from the experts, and within that environment, 
what are the most affordable, cost-effective agents to make available to our members, not just those with diabetes, but all of our members.